So grab your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 is where we are as we go into the Christmas story for this year. We'll read, come back, make some comments. As you're turning there, I was thinking about a question I got the other day. Somebody asked me a question about one of the, the, the characters in the Christmas story, if you will, and they, they were trying to figure out how it fit, and it reminded me that when you read through the Christmas story, it's spread between two Gospels, and it kind of seems a little choppy, as we're going to talk about today. And, and as you drive around, even worse, you drive around town, you look at nativity scenes, that can be a little confusing. So I surveyed nativity scenes. I got one for you I found. Um, this church did an awesome job of building a set. They got lights strung up. I mean, did really good. I think they, they did a, a wonderful job. You look at this scene, you got... On the left, you got the shepherds, and I think what appears to be a goat. That's a goat. Okay, I don't, think, I don't think the goat should be there, but it's okay. The star, star looks real good. You got Joseph and Mary in the middle. Jesus, I guess, in the, well, I'm not sure where he's at. All right. He's, she's either holding him or he's in the thing, the manger there. Then to the right, well, actually, yeah, to your right, you have three wise men who actually don't belong. We'll talk about today. They're all wearing crowns. All in all, I give him an 80. <laughs> this is as good as what you most of the see most of the time, right? However, it is wrong. But we're going to look at that today in Matthew chapter 2. So grab your Bibles. If you're there, look at it with me. Matthew chapter 2, if you're there, say amen. amen. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came, from, came to Jerusalem came from the east to Jerusalem. I messed that up. Verse 2. Saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we, here we go. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together and inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, Well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and mirth. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed from their own country another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise man, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in its district from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah lamenting, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child 
and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archicus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. That's a common theme. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. And we love you for allowing us to be here today, Lord God. I pray even now at this very moment, as we turn our hearts to you, those of us who can, those who can't, that you would help them, Lord God, that you would open our hearts, that you would remove the cares of this life, the thoughts of our hearts and minds away from us, Lord, that you would remove even the distractions from the room, that you would speak to us by your spirit, both collectively and individually, giving us the things that we need, Lord God, for correction and for comfort, that we would receive those things, we would grow there by those things, Lord God, and that not only would we be blessed, Lord, that you would then be blessed with our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. We say together, saints, amen, amen. amen. If you have been with us, because we know we, we think about the Christmas story, but if we think about this story through the eyes or even the lens, I should say, of where we've been the last several months, it takes on a, a whole different form. If you view it through the book of Galatians, and the book of Ephesians, you begin to draw the conclusion that this story and all that is happening did not take place 2,000 years ago alone, but it began in eternity's past as we learn in the book of Ephesians that God chose each one of us who belonged to him before the foundation of the world, predestined us in Christ Jesus, and has accepted us, redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, and sealed us by the Holy Spirit of promise, right? We know that, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, y'all remember that he might gather all things in one, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Christ Jesus, right? Oh, Lord. <laughs> they closed the cafe. Y'all didn't get any coffee. That's what it is. Man, first service was riled up. Y'all know the rules. Stay with me, okay? We understand that, right? That all of this, none of this is, and it came to pass as though it was happening in reaction to anything. But all of this is a part of God's eternal plan and purpose, which we have been learning in the book of Ephesians, right? Which in times past was a mystery, was an unknown, but has been revealed, the mystery being revealed now in this current age. That God might display his manifold wisdom to principalities and powers through the church. Y'all remember that, right? It's amazing that God had all of this planned out and everything that happens in this realm is in the flow of fulfilling his will and his purpose at all times, which is why we can say when we quote Romans chapter 28 that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose because there's no other way for things to flow, especially towards those of us who belong to him. If you know the Lord, if you're filled with his spirit, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then everything that converges on the scene has to work together for your good, which sometimes may not bring you immediate comfort, but it is going to work together for your good. And this, this scene, this Christmas story is all a part of that. This is something that had been unfolding for generations and centuries and, and millennia before, and we now come to see it. Remember what I quoted you, that the scholars, one scholar said it this way, it is as if a great drama is being enacted. History is the theater, the world is a stage, the church members in every land are the actors. God himself has written the play and directs and produces it, act by act, scene by scene, the story continues to unfold. But who is the audience? Remember, we talked about that. And it is the principalities and powers, but the angelic hosts that have watched this whole thing unfold and see those of us who have never seen him accept him and walk by faith. And it's a beautiful thing. And all of that is unfolding. And now when we dive into this Christmas story, this is the same thing that we will discover here. And we'll look at it as we go through here. Let's pick it up in verse 1 and let's dive in. Let's look at it verse by verse. Notice it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. After he was born, as we're going to discover as we go through this, that we are somewhere between 12 and 20 more, 24 months into the Christmas story. Jesus has, uh, is no longer a baby as we go through this. That's why the nativity was wrong that we looked at because the wise men and the shepherds wouldn't have been hanging out there at the same time. 
And notice it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, notice it's in the days of Herod the king. It gives us a, a time frame that we can look at. Herod the king, listen, Herod the king was, uh, this is Herod the Great. There were many Herods. You read the Bible, you can get really confused trying to figure out which Herod is which, fooling around with the Herods and getting in trouble, you know. <laughs> but this is Herod the Great. This one, this particular Herod, um, the Jews had a love-hate relationship with him. You know, they, they on one side couldn't stand the man, and he wanted to be considered a Jew. He had some Jewish roots. But on the other side, they actually loved the man, and the reason they liked him is because Herod built them a most magnificent temple that we read about in Scripture. And this temple was amazing. In fact, Herod went to them and he says there should, this temple in Jerusalem should be amazing because Herod loved to build really extravagant buildings. History tells us that he was about four point something feet tall. So he had issues. <laughs> so all the buildings he built were really big. And he was a little guy. And so he went to the Jews. He says, this ain't right. We need to really build a nice temple. And the Jews had issues with that because when you build a temple for the Jews, only Levites can work on the temple. And so, and you, you got to close the first temple in order to build the new temple on the same foundation. Y'all understand these things? So there was this huge thing. And Herod called the Jews together. And Josephus tells us he, he made a speech towards them. And he, he won them over. And they agreed. And they began to, on the same site, build a new and most amazing, amazing temple. And Herod built it. It was one of the wonders of the world. Jerusalem back then looked like something that we would be even amazed at today. You know, if we could actually see the real ruins of the temple, but we can't. They're not there. But so they loved him for that purpose. And this is the king that we're speaking of here. It was in the land of Judea after Jesus was born when Herod the Great was king. But notice what happened. It says, and behold, listen, wise men came from the east. Wise men. The word in the Greek is magus, and it, we get magi from it as well, if we understand. And it's a name given to men from the east of the Chaldeans who were uh, of a priestly class, if you will, very educated, very learned men of the Medes and the Persians as well. And these men, listen, they were teachers, priests, physicians, considered even astrologers or seers or interpreters. And all of the ancient kings would have some grouping of these men or some men that were part of this classification that would be in a special position within the kingdom to advise the king. We see that, to give them advice. We even see that way back in the Exodus story as Pharaoh had men like this around him, the same men who withstood Moses, Janus and Jambres. Y'all remember that? These men were actually able for a moment to duplicate some of the things which God had given to Moses to be signs to Pharaoh. And by the hand of Satan, these magicians were able to do some of them, not all, some of them. So all of the kings had these wise men around them. Now, a lot of scholars believe that these particular wise men showed up in Jerusalem because in part to what Daniel did while he was there in Babylon while the Jews were captive for 70 years. Y'all remember that, right? And we can't say that for sure, but it could be possible. Y'all remember the scene? Listen, stay with me for a moment. Daniel and his boys taken captive into Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar at the time, he was having dreams. And one dream really messed him up. He woke up and from that one and he couldn't shake it. It was really troubling him. And he wanted somebody to interpret a dream. But he already knew that these crackpots that were his wise men were not always right. So he called them together. He said, look, this is how it's going to go down this time. Y'all stay with me. This is how it's going to go down. I'm not telling you to dream. You're going to tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it or I'm going to kill all of you. So now everybody's upset, okay? So, so everybody's upset. Daniel comes in, and he has permission to see the king, and he comes in, oh, king, live forever. Listen, the God that I serve, he will tell you your dream and interpret it. You just give me some time. So the king said, all right, he gave him a little time. Daniel went back, got with his boys, and they start fasting and praying all night. God gives Daniel both the dream and interpretation. Daniel goes before the king. He says, king, don't worry. My God has revealed it to me, and he told it to him. In Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 47, I'll pick it up there. The king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is the God of gods. 
the Lord, Lord of kings, and a revealer of the secret, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king, notice this, promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and look, chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel got promoted to the leader of the wise men. In other words, Daniel now is the chief of the wise men in Babylon, even though he didn't subscribe to their way of doing things. And it is possible, listen, it's possible at least that this happened. Because we can't say for sure Daniel had anything to do with the wise men coming to Jerusalem. But it is very well possible, Daniel being the godly man that he is, that being now over them, he changed their methodology and way that they viewed things and even went about the processes and their focus of what they were doing. And these wouldn't be, these guys that showed up, they wouldn't be your kind of like your, your, your gypsy kind of folks. No, these would be the PhDs from Harvard and the, the scientific community that showed up saying, hey, something happened. And it's possible that Daniel influenced that. One thing before I move on I like about Daniel. Notice verse 49 on the screen. I think we got it. It says, also Daniel petitioned the king. I don't think we have it. Said so when he got promoted, he petitioned the king that the king would also promote his boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love that. So Daniel, as, after he got promoted, he didn't leave his boys behind. He said, y'all fasted with me. Hey, king, let, you know, you got to bring my boys along. So they got promoted. Side note. Okay. So we got these guys. Focus on the text. Look at it with me. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men, men that were of a specific classification of men who were learned and, and, and studied quite a bit, this particular group of men showed up from the east and they came to Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing is this. They showed up, verse 2, look at it with me, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And as we go through this scene, what you discover is it doesn't seem like anybody really has any word for them at all. These men showed up to ask, where is the king of the Jews? And everybody look at them like, what you talking about? Now, you got to understand the scene for a minute. These men were directed to Jerusalem. We'll get into maybe how in a minute. But in the classification of work that they did, the things that, that were before them, the things that they were doing, something that happened gave them the inclination that they needed to go to Judea because the king of the Jews has been born. But they show up and nobody even looks and even, even is like, what are you talking about? It's amazing. Look, these men who came from the east, we don't know how many there actually were. We have three in the nativity scene that I put up, didn't we? Because there were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We'll talk about it in a minute. So in every nativity scene, you've got to have at least three guys. One got to hold the gold, and one got to hold the frankincense, and one has to hold the myrrh, right? So we always got three dudes sitting up there. Now, you think, you imagine three dudes coming across the desert with gold. They ain't going to make it. <laughs> it ain't, it ain't going to happen. They couldn't even get through Clayton, you know. <laughs> but you got to understand this for a second. Hold on. So three guys came across. It would have taken them time to plan this trip. They would have had to pack supplies to bring with them. And they're carrying very valuable spices and gold, so they would have had to have an entourage of security guards with them as well. So it would look like this. Let's put it in modern terms. It would look like an entourage, if you will, or a caravan, a black SUV stretch, some of them, <laughs> just rolled into town, and they come in, and then some guys hop out with some AKs and open the door, and some guys get out saying, hey, where is the king of the Jews? And everybody's like, what on earth is going on? What's happening? These men show up looking for a king. Nobody knows what they're talking about. The interesting thing about that, listen, the very interesting thing about this whole Christmas scene, we're going to do Luke chapter 2 tomorrow night at the, at the Christmas Eve. When Jesus was born, similar thing happened. If the angels didn't show up and, and grab some shepherds and say, hey, something big just happened, they ran in to see it, it would have came and gone and nobody would have known a thing. Kind of like right now in Clayton, Everything is going on like there ain't no Messiah. Have you been to Walmart in the last 72 hours? <laughs> they ain't thinking about Jesus in Walmart. You got to go in there with your elbows ready, you know, <laughs> ready to throw something in case because it's all crazy. I went to Walmart last night, and I, I ran into like four people from church. So I was in there to get one thing for an hour. 
hour and a half if you include the lines. Nobody cares about Messiah. The way the world was back then is the way the world is now. Nobody cares. There ain't no room in the inn. Ain't no room in the hearts of people. And if anybody show up asking about him, don't nobody know what they're talking about. Because nobody is really concerned about the real Messiah and who he is. And that's what was happening here. So they show up like, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And it tells us, listen, it tells us that something about what these men did for a living and what they were paying attention to led them there. Verse 2 goes on to tell us, look at it with me again. It says, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And a very interesting thing about that is when I read it this time, it really caught me. It didn't say we saw a star that was interesting. We saw his star. You catch that? I love this. Like God is going to make sure that his son gets worshiped one way or another. Reminds me of how Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the last time in his, his earthly life and ministry. And he rode into Jerusalem and, and people were worshiping Hosanna. Blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisee says, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus says, I can't because this is the day the Lord has made. And if they don't worship me, the rocks are going to cry out. So you might as well accept it. And God is going to do that. In the, even in the Christmas story, the angels went and a whole host of angels appeared to the, to the shepherds and they ran into town. You know, and then these men coming from the east, God is making sure that his son gets worshipped. But it says that there was, we saw his star in the east. A star that told them that a Hebrew king has been born and they went to Jerusalem. And the interesting thing about this star, I began to think about it. I was like, well, wait a minute. Should the Messiah actually have a star? Well, according to the prophets, most likely, then this is what was driving him possibly. Yes, he should. Because it tells us that in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, on the screen, check it out with me. It says, in him, excuse me, I see him. There it is. But not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the bow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. In other words, kind of woven through the Old Testament scriptures, something interesting. Should he have a star? Well, yeah, I see him, I behold him, but not near. But there's a time coming when a star shall rise out of Jacob. Maybe this is part of the things that are driving these guys. We don't know. Listen, should he have a star? Well, maybe. The Bible tells us that Gentiles would respond to it. Isaiah 60, verse 3, on the screen. Look at Isaiah 60. It says, The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. I like this. This is why in some of the uh, nativities, the wise men are wearing crowns. Because many believe that the wise men were kings, and that's possible that they were kings and not just part of a priestly class of men. We don't really know. But Isaiah seems to think that, hey, that he should have a star. And, and, why, and Gentiles and even kings will be drawn to it, to the brightness of his light, the brightness of his rise. And I love that. You know, stars are important to God. Isaiah 40, verse 26 on the screen, it says, lift up your eyes on high and see. He's talking about the stars and the, and the, and the host in the sky. He says, and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. And what Isaiah is saying is God who created all of them, the stars, it says that, that basically they have a number. He knows what that number is. They also have a name. They've all been named and he knows all of their names. And it says not one is missing, which means that God knows what where all of them are. They're all where they're supposed to be. That's huge because I can't find them. I go outside, I can't find a Big Dipper some nights. I can't find any people like, oh, that's that and that's that. I'm like, well, okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> he says, look, I know how many there is. I've named all of them, and I know where all of them are. And they speak. David says this in the Psalm, Psalm 19, 1 through 4 on the screen. Check it out. David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice has not been heard. Uh, their line has gone out through all the earth and their, uh, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. I love that. And even Paul quotes it. I'm sorry. Yeah, Paul over in Romans chapter 10. Paul quotes this. He says, 
Romans 10, 17 to 18, he says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. It's actually now nice, but uh, yeah, nice little theme music in the background going there. <laughs> the sound guy's like, yeah, I don't hear it. Anybody hear that? <laughs> yeah. it like a oh, it's a phone. <laughs> Yeah. Cell phones are the way demons get into the service, you know. <laughs> Slam it on the floor. All right. He says here, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out into all the earth. Paul saying that they know there's a God by these things. It's very interesting. Woven through the scripture says his star we have seen. In other words, we saw something that is attributed to a king that would come from Israel. And there was this belief back then that there would be a king that would come out of Judea um, that was this kind of like a common uh, myth that was going on. But I don't think that's what this is. Some scholars believe that that's what was going on. No, I believe there was something specific happening. We don't know what it is. There are several theories. There are two that say that what this was was it was some type of conjunction of planets that came together so close that it formed a, a, a what would be such a bright, magnificent appearance that it was so different that the Magi would have paid attention to it. And there are two different theories as to exactly when this happened, 6 or 7 B.C. or 2 and 3 B.C. and all that kind of stuff. And you can get into all of that if you want to. I think it's very interesting, though. One of them says that it would have been a conjunction of both Jupiter and Venus, Venus being the third brightest object in the sky and Jupiter being the fourth, and you bring the two of them together, and they would have formed a merger right around, I forget the date, 2-something B.C., and it would have been the brightest object in the sky at the time. It would have been seen very clearly by the naked eye that it occurred fairly low, and it was very impressive. And Jupiter, you know, has been viewed as... Uh, uh, the king, if you will, of gods and, and all of that, and, and we, we know that. And uh, it also talks about uh, Regulus as being viewed as a kingly star, and, and we get the word regal from that, and the root of that is Regulus, and people talk about that, and they go on to say that Regulus is in the constellation of the lion, Leo, Leo the lion, and so this marked the birth of an important king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and it sounds really good, and that could be that this happened. What I know is that it seems as though in the history of time, the stars have been used in two different ways. By man, it's been used in witchcraft, and, and even in the 70s, man, the Zodiac was big. Some of y'all still got stuff in boxes from the 70s where you were tracking your life using the Zodiac. I know. Shake if you don't let, come on, be honest. I'm, I'm Leo the Lion, basically. I'm born in August, you know, and I used to hear that stuff and the horoscope would come up every, you know, tune in the radio. What they say about mine? Come on now, be honest. Y'all so spiritual, you won't be honest on Christmas. You can't lie on Christmas. And none of that stuff really matters. But I do believe that through the years, God has displayed his gospel message in the constellations. And I believe that was the purpose of all of that. And, and it's possible then that that is the case. Let's watch the behavior of it and we'll see. Maybe you can draw your own conclusion. So it's saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen, notice, his star in the east. And we have come, this is the big deal, to worship him. And the truth of the matter is, in all of this that's going on, that's the whole point. The old lady at the nursing home when we were doing the outreach, remember I told you, the 94-year-old lady, and she said, 94 years old, her son said it forward, and she got it out, but her voice was a little weak. But she said it clear as day. She says, 94 years old, she says, if you miss Jesus, you've missed all. The whole point is worshiping Christ. And they made that journey to worship Christ. And in everything that's going on in our lives today, in the world that we live in currently, if we go through all of this and we forget and miss worshiping Christ, then we miss the whole point of everything that's going on. Listen, men, heads of your homes, this is what you need to do on Christmas morning before you let anybody focus their attention on material things of this world. You should sit them down and draw their attention first to the one who should be worshiped, Jesus Christ. And you should open up the Bible and read the Christmas story as a family. 
and then give thanks for everything that God has done before you look at any earthly material thing which is going to burn, Peter says, with a fervent heat. We can't take any of it to heaven with us. It has no eternal value. But Christ is eternal, and we then are eternal in him. And so in all of this, they came to worship him, and nobody else in Bethlehem had a clue what was going on. Now, notice it says as we continue, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, notice he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now, I told you he was a little short dude, right? So he already had issues, but history tells us that he was actually very paranoid as well. And his paranoia got worse as he got older and was having health issues. So much so that this man, listen, he became very violent. He was a bloody ruler. He had, listen, began to annihilate the Sanhedrin. And one time he killed 300 court officials. He murdered his own wife and his own son, several sons, because he thought they was, you know, conspiring. Caesar Augustus said, and he's been quoted saying, that I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Because he, he, he wanted to be a Jew so he didn't eat pork. So you were safe in the pig pen, <laughs> safer than you would be in the palace, because if he thought you wanted his position, you were going to die. And he was a very, very, very uh, crazy man. And so when he was troubled, all Jerusalem had reason to be troubled because he was crazy. The little guy would cause some problems. And so he was troubled. All Jerusalem is now troubled with him. You got this group of men who have come to town that everybody knows they're there. It's the talk of the town. These men have come and they're looking for a king and Herod ain't the one they're looking for. You know, and everybody is upset and everybody trying to figure out what's going on. It's the talk of the town. Let's continue. Verse 4. Notice, first, Herod wants to know two things, where and when. Notice in verse 4, the where. He says, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and people together, the chief priests and scribes of the people together, so he calls them all to the palace. I want all the priests. I want all the scribes. I want the priests. These are the ones who are supposed to be serving God. I want the scribes. These are the experts in the law. Now, you guys, notice in verse 4, he inquired of them. He says, tell me where the Christ, which means the anointed one of God, it means the Messiah, where is he to be born? Now, check this out. Verse 5 and 6 is the saddest part of the whole story up until the time where he kills the boys. Check this out. The priests and the scribes say to him, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written in the prophets, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd his people Israel. I read it that way because that's how they said it. Oh, yeah, out of Judea, man. I mean, we're sending the prophets. You know, and then he dismissed them and they went back to their own business like nothing had happened. They didn't even think to say, well, you know what? It's strange, isn't it? We got these guys who came from the east, the region of Babylon somewhere. Some people believe it was Babylon. Some people believe it was a town northeast of Babylon. Wherever they came from that region. They showed up, and these dudes ain't no joke. They come into town with great pomp, and they said that there should be a king. They've seen his star in the east, and these clowns, the scribes and Pharisees, don't even think, well, you know, maybe we should look into this just to, be, just to figure this out and be safe. Maybe we should roll out to Bethlehem too. Maybe we should just go down the hall to where the scrolls are and grab a few and try to figure out, well, you know, Daniel did tell us that about the time the Messiah would show up, and all of this, and we know where he's to be born. We know all of these things. Maybe we should investigate and see if that's the case. And they didn't even bother. This is the condition of, of the world at the time that Jesus came in. And it's the condition of the world now. You know how many people even at churches are just going through the motions? And not even stopping to really think about what is, what is Christ, what is he doing right now in this season, Christmas of 2018, that concerns my life. How is he trying to speak to me today? What would he have for me to do? What changes does he want to make in my life? Forget New Year's resolutions. I already know what mine is. I was helping a 75-year-old guy. We were building something the other day, and my knees were killing me, and he was bouncing. He's like, look at you. You're getting old. This 75-year-old man said that to me. I already know what mine is. I got to get right. I can't have a 75-year-old man, you know, outworking me. But we think about those things. But, but think about it for a minute. What is Christ saying to you today? Is he speaking to you? What's his plans for your life? Are you dismissing him? Does he matter? Is he important? Are you here today only because this is what you do the Sunday before Christmas? You know, 
they, they've dismissed it. But Herod has a plan. He wants to know where. So he got that from these knuckleheads. And then he now needs to know when. So he calls in the wise men, verse 7. Notice it says, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he didn't make this a big deal. See, we get the impression that the wise men showed up and they straight went to the palace and talked to Herod. I get the impression that Herod is watching what's going on and got people telling him what's happening in the street. And now, you know, he's finally like, okay, let me meet with these guys. Because he's concerned. He don't like the fact that they're there because they're not there for him. But he secretly calls for them. Verse 7, he calls the wise man and he determined from them what time the star appeared. In other words, about what time did all of this happen? You say you saw his star in the east and you know a king has been born. About when did all of that happen? And they probably said something that gave him a date that was 12 to 16 months earlier at least. This is about when it happened. And we know it was significant because we're experts in the sky. We know what all the planets do, where all the stars are supposed to be, their rotations, their movements. We're experts. It's all mathematical. Okay, it's not, even, it's not even rocket science even. It's just mathematical stuff. You can track it. They've built software that tracks this stuff. You can go backwards and forwards and look at what the sky is doing. They said, so we saw this particular occurrence that speaks to us of a king on this date in the past, 12 to 16 months earlier. That's what they give him, something like that. And so notice what he does, verse 8. He now has the place. He now has the time frame. So he sent them to Bethlehem, verse 8, and says, Go search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And you got to understand something, y'all, the deception of Satan. Jesus says Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy, right? Um, John said that there's a spirit of Antichrist. We have to test the spirits who's in the world, who's always been in the world even. We understand that. Herod is of the spirit of antichrist kind of like pharaoh was when pharaoh threw all the boys in the river trying to prevent a deliverer you follow me kind of like hitler was when he sent six million to the gas chambers because he's trying to destroy a work of god you, you hear me kind of like the kings of the earth or the presidents and prime ministers of the earth today do because what they don't want is a flourishing israel that's in control of their own land and capital you see, because there's a spirit of Antichrist that wants to destroy and come against the plan and the purposes of God that were already laid out in eternity's past and will happen no matter what. That's what all of this is about. And so he says, listen, you guys go, work, go find out where he's at. Worship him, then come let me know so I can go worship him too. And you know how Herod's going to worship? He's going to send a sword in because he wants to kill Jesus. Jesus had a hit on his life from the beginning. That hit goes back to Genesis 3.15 when, when God says, hey, the seed of the woman, you're just going to put enmity between the seed of the woman and your seed, Satan. Interesting words. We won't go into that now. And, and you shall bruise his heel and he shall crush your head. And, and, that, and that, 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 that thing has been playing out ever since. And so when they heard the king, verse 9, they departed. It says they heard him. Doesn't say they agreed. They just went their way. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east, check it out, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now we're back on the star. Now I like this. So it implies something. Because notice what it says in verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they had rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. In other words, they saw this star when they were in the east. It indicated something for them. They planned their trip, they packed their stuff, and they broke camp for Jerusalem. But when they showed up in Jerusalem, there wasn't a star for them to see. So therefore, they didn't go to Bethlehem. They went into Jerusalem and inquired, where's the king of the Jews? So now, the prophets, everybody understand Bethlehem. The king is sending them to Bethlehem, and then the star reappears to give them an indication of something. You following this? And then it says that, check it out again in verse 9, when, when they heard this, they departed, and behold, that's a, that's a, we understand that word in scripture. Behold, it means take note. Here's something to take note of. The star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over the place where the child was, which speaks of the fact that the star was moving. Now, those who support the first theory I gave you says that it was retrograde motion in the planets. And at that particular year, I believe it was that Jupiter 
uh, made three, three circling motions and that that was the movement which they saw and it could very well be that the Magi had such uh, precise instruments that they were actually able to calculate and track this. But the interesting thing, and you draw your own conclusion, is not only did it move, it went before them and led them and it came and stood. And notice what it says here. It says it, it stood over where the young child was. Does that mean it stood over his specific house? Because when I look at the stars, they generally kind of stand over everything. So if you can track them to a general location, so if you could track it to being over Clayton, guess what? It's over every house in Clayton. I'm like, I don't, okay, so, but we don't know, but we don't know is the point. We don't really know. But somehow that star came and it moved and it stood over where the young child was. Was it a star? Was it the movement of the planets and stuff that we already understand? Was it a specific supernatural star that God had put in place for this specific time? Was it an angel? We really don't know, y'all. We don't have to get caught up in it. What I like about the theories is the theories show us that there's more going on than we actually know and understand. And there's amazing things that are happening. But this here is something very interesting. And it's beautiful to be able to see that God was able to use the, this star this way to lead these men to a specific location where they could come in. And verse 10 says, they rejoice exceedingly. Verse 11 says, and when they had come into, notice the house. Notice that Jesus is no longer in an inn, in a stable, and in a manger. You see that, right? When they came into the house and they saw, notice the young child with Mary, his mother. Now catch this. They see a child. The wording is not infant here used at all in this chapter. Jesus is now in a house. Why? Because it's almost two years later. Jesus and Mary are in the house. Where's Joseph? Well, man, you know where Joseph is. This is, this is, this is life. Joseph had to get a job. He paying the rent. <laughs> Joseph come home after work, coming down the street with a, with, a, with a loaf of bread, and he turned on his block, and there's an entourage of SUVs, <laughs> and, and they parked in front of his house. And Joseph's like, what in the world? What's going on now? You know, what Jesus do this time, you know? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just joking. And so they enter the house. Notice, and when they enter the house, they see the young child with Mary, his mother, Joseph not there. The interesting thing, too, is that at this point, Jesus is a young child of almost two years of age. Now, I thought about going to the nursery and bringing a two-year-old over, two over to illustrate this, but I couldn't because we know that they are going through this period of time which we call the terrible twos. <laughs> and so if I brought a two-year-old over, that would wreck the whole service, right? <laughs> but Jesus was God, so he wasn't your typical two-year-old. Can you even imagine what Jesus was like? Remember at 12, he astonished the, the scholars. You know, he wasn't your typical two-year-old. Mary would go in his room in the morning. Jesus already folded his clothes and his just, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, he already then put his toys away and, you know, dressed and ready to go and stuff like that. And Mary's just like, man, you know, Gabriel was right, you know. <laughs> and they come in and when they open their treasures, notice this. First of all, they were worshiping him. Now, you got to understand something, and this goes back to a lot of things we've studied, y'all. Just give me some time. Throughout Scripture, only God receives worship. And they worshiped him. God the Father didn't, didn't rebuke them. No angel showed up and rebuked them. And Mary, at this point, she's like, she already knows, man, this is, this is, this is something unfolding that's bigger than me. They're worshiping a two-year-old child because God took upon himself human flesh, you see. They opened their treasures, verse 11, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. I love that, because we present gifts to him. He's blessed us. We don't talk about giving unless it comes up in scripture, but he's blessed us, and we bless back with, with joy, like, just like they're doing. And it says they opened their treasures, and they presented gifts to him, and they gave three. Now, we don't know if they knew why they were given these three, if God just worked it out this way or if they were doing it this way because of all that they understood. But notice the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and mirth. These three gifts, gifts excuse me, tell us about the ministry and the life of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, and everything that he was about. Number one, gold, because he was a king, royalty. We understand that. He is king of the Jews. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. You know, the kingdom belongs to him. And he will come and establish it. Amen? We know that. 
So gold because he's a king. Frankincense because frankincense is one of the spices that would be used by the priest to make both the anointing oil and the, uh, anointing oil and the incense. So it would be used in the duty of a priest. And so Jesus received frankincense from them because Jesus carries the role and office of the only remaining true high priest. Right? He is our high priest who can sympathize with us because he's been tempted in every way, right? High priest, a priest means a mediator between God and man. And the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for us all, which leads us to the final gift that they gave him, myrrh, which was a spice that was used in anointing dead bodies or embalming dead bodies for burial, which speaks of the fact of Jesus would die because he would also be the sacrifice that would pay for the sins of all who would come to him for salvation. So it speaks of his complete work that Jesus is the king who left heaven and came to earth. And he gave his life in death to pay for our sin and now has been risen up to be at the right hand of the father where he is our high priest making intercession for us on a daily basis and his whole ministry being seen right here in the beginning. I love that, don't you? It's so beautiful to see all of that. They worshiped him, the one who would lay his life down and pay him for our sin. And we, we've talked about that and we're out of time. The other reason why they gave him these very, very expensive gifts, because you think about they presented these gifts in worship to a two-year-old. What's he going to do with it? I mean, you show up at my house with some gifts, you don't give them to the baby, you're going to give them to me, you know? <laughs> but there is good practical reason for that. As you know how the story ends, and we don't have time to finish it, God is going to speak to Joseph in a dream and say, hey, Herod's going to try to kill the child, to seek to destroy him. Take him and his mother and go to Egypt, 80-mile journey. He's a carpenter seeking work. He's a contractor. He's a, he's a construction worker. He's on somebody's crew framing houses trying to pay rent while they're there in Bethlehem. Now he's got to pack up and leave Bethlehem and go an 80-mile journey to a very expensive city, Nothing like Bethlehem. It'd be like leaving Clayton and now going to New York. And you live in check to check. And you got to you gotta now pack up and take your family to New York. And you know how expensive it is there compared to Clayton. But God hooked them up. He's got gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So he can pay for the journey. Ain't God something. He worked it all out. He always does. And so that's what's happening here. And God will work all of these things out for those of us who follow him every day. He doesn't let us down. He doesn't forget us. He doesn't leave us hanging. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the God we serve. He showed up in a very simple way on Christmas that he may be able to minister to all of us for all eternity. And that's what we see as we go through this. Now, tomorrow night, we'll get into the traditional part of the story that everybody likes with the shepherds and the angels and, and, and all that stuff and the, stay, and the end and no room there at all. We'll do that tomorrow night. But for right now, as, as the worship team comes up and you bow your head, stay focused, bow your head, worship team come up. For now, I challenge you to leave here today with all of these, you know, simple truths that separates the real Christmas story from the stuff that we see every day when we go out. And everybody is so focused on things that don't matter. But you bring your heart and your mind and your family's attention to Christ. And focus on him. Enjoy your Christmas. In your year, looking to the Lord and Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of our, you know, of our lives, the one who laid down everything for us and has been raised up in victory and now seated up in the right hand of the throne in heaven, praying for you and I daily, who has promised to come back for us. Bow your heads for me. Close your eyes. He's promised to come back for us. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I leave you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And I'll come again and receive you to myself, that you may be where I am, and that for all eternity. And those were the promises he made, and he has a plan. He's been preparing a, a place for 2,000 years. He's going to come back. He promised to return. That is the way we live as Christians. We live focused on the hope of the coming of the Lord. And he is coming back for those who belong to him. To rescue us, it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And so, the whole point of the Christmas story is that you know that truth and you prepare yourself. So are you ready for his coming is the question. Because he didn't stay a baby. He became a man. 
And he nailed that man to a cross and he bled out on that cross. He said on that cross, Father, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit to the Father. And three days later, he got up rejoicing. And so we worship a living Savior who is going to return for those who have given their lives to him. The question is, have you turned your heart to him? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? If not, now is the time to receive him. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, only I and the Lord see you. If you want to come to him today, put your hand up where you are, and I'll pray with you. No looking around, y'all. Be obe obedient sheep. I know it's hard. This is a time for those who are wrestling with that truth. If you want to come to Jesus, put your hand up, and I'll receive you. Father, we do thank you today. We love you for who you are and all you've done. Pray that you would go before everybody here, every family. Be with us in our cars, Lord God, on uh, in the highways, the byways, the marketplaces, all the places we have to go, those who have to go to work, school, any of those things, be with us, keep us, give us discernment, draw us to our knees, draw us into a deeper relationship with you. We love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name. We say together, saints, amen, amen. Let's stand, let's worship. Merry Christmas. See you tomorrow night.